Thank you, Melissa. And thank you very much for the invitation. Am I either too loud? This is about how I usually talk. So if it's too loud in the back, OK? Great. So again, Melissa and I have overlapped uh, in, a, in a number of different ways. So it's very nice to have some extended conversations here and also with Vince and others who I haven't seen for a while. Today, I'll be talking about a portion of what we do in the area of what I term quantitative viral ecology. And I'll give a few plugs at the end. Um, and that spans thinking about virus-host interactions, let's say, in model systems in the laboratory, also in the field. I'll probably do a little less field uh, than, than might otherwise be possible in a, in a longer format. But I do hope to communicate, as Melissa said, some of that excitement to all of you, but maybe some background information. So I'll begin with background. And I don't know if there's any way to turn down the lights a little bit. Just is there maybe one? I don't want to make it too much, just a little bit. You can see the most interesting man in the world here. So that's important. That won't be any hard. He's not hard to see. So anyway, otherwise it'll, it's OK. A little, oh, that's too much. <laughs> if those are the two options, I prefer the, that one. That's, Vince, it's OK. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> Let's do it like that. That's fine. Let's go back to where we start. So this is the most interesting man in the world. If you like Dos Equis, um, you know this person. And I just want to start this way. It's, there's really no reason to start this way. I just like putting this up. <laughs> Uh, but I'm going to try to contrast it with the most boring PowerPoint slide in the world. And so I put this up in part because this is the kind of slide that you're not supposed to put up in talks. It just has numbers and there's experiments and replicas. But I will claim that this table, this table of information, is the most interesting table in the history of biological sciences ever. I don't care what you work on. This table most interesting table. And I want to point out why I think it's very interesting. If you look at experiment five, you go across this row. These are different replicas. The numbers represent the number of colonies, or some assay here and some experimental conditions, measured given the same experimental setup across replicas. Wait, uh, give me a moment. But uh, Good. Uh, so across replicas. And if you notice here, we'll get to this gentleman in a moment. He's very eager. There are zeros, 107. So this is the same experiment, different replicas, totally different. And this is the sort of thing that, as a student, you don't want to share with your advisor. I did the experiment 10 times. Sometimes I got zero, sometimes I got 107. Like, just bury that. But don't, <laughs> don't even share. But again, this is published. It's very important. So there's one person who's already guessed, but I'll ask you. We'll give you credit in a moment. Does anyone know, beside this gentleman, who is correct? Uh, where this is from? Any of the students? No? Okay, well, you can go ahead now. Luria. Luria and Delbrook. Okay, so this was a classic experiment done in the 40s. Mutations of bacteria from virus sensitivity to virus resistance. So now I'm getting into the reason why I included this in the first place. And the setup of this experiment, which I've just inverted here, and you can see it, all I did was give you a subset this set of uh, replicas for that given experiment was to understand the frequency by which exposure to viruses which should have killed these target cells led to the emergence evolution of a resistant type. How frequently would that happen? But it wasn't just a matter of defining the frequency, but rather to understand were mutations independent of selection or dependent on selection. And this variability, this thing that seems very strange, was in fact the key evidence to understand that mutations were actually independent of selection. And it was part of the reason they won the Nobel Prize in 1969. So let me explain that concept and then link in to what I view as a lot of the modern kind of excitement of, of viral ecology. So just to review, and maybe some of you once knew this and you've forgotten, but it's certainly worthwhile to remember it. So at the time, it was not known if mutations were independent of selection or arose as a result of interaction with the selective so we can imagine a case in which mutations depend on interaction with the selective pressure, in which case we have this ancestral type, which is susceptible. You grow over a certain number of generations, sufficient number that you then put on this agar plate, exposed to so many viruses that when you put the viruses onto the agar plate, all of the hosts will interact with at least one virus. And then if mutations depend on interaction with the virus, then a certain fraction of time, a resistant cell will evolve. And you can imagine if this occurs with some small probability, then across replicas, we should have some Poisson distribution of mutations, which is 
maybe small, but fairly similar between replicates. So that is the notion if mutations arise because of an interaction with some selective pressure. On the other hand, if mutations are independent of selection, then as this colony is growing, or as this population is growing, then at some point there will be a mutation event, so an evolutionary event in which now we have a resistant uh, cell. All of the daughter cells are also resistant, ignoring revert mutations. And now, before we expose these bacteria to viruses, some of them are already resistant. We expose, and now it's possible that a large number of the bacteria we find are resistant. How many there are depends on how far back in time that resistant mutant arose. Sometimes it just happened a generation ago. Sometimes three or four. So with some infrequency, you will get a very large number of resistant mutants. And so if one looks at the variability here, you expect the variability to be quite large, non-Poisson. And so that variability was the key to understanding the difference between the two. And for any of you who study CRISPR-Cas, if you've heard of CRISPR-Cas, you probably get ads to get your genes mutated tomorrow using the CRISPR-Cas technology. This is a defense system within archaea and bacteria. And if they had used, I'm talking about Lurie and Delbrook, Streptococcus thermophilus, which is the model organism for CRISPR-Cas based immunity, they might have actually discovered that mutations depend on selection. So the, the history would have been a little bit different, right? So there are versions in which bacteria can acquire resistance as a result of interaction with the virus. But for the most part, we think it operates this way, and this is what helped us understand it. So this is all well and good, and this also explains now why I claim that this really is the most interesting table in biological sciences ever, but it also is relevant to viral ecology. So if we were to take something away from this early study is that viruses impose a strong selective pressure. Obviously, host mutations that confer resistance to virus infection lysis are beneficial, and therefore, viruses induce host evolution, meaning the presence of viruses changes the frequency of genotypes. Now we have this other genotype, this resistant genotype, which dominates, presumably, over time. But what about the viruses? So here, this was just thinking about how viruses might affect the emergence of host resistance. So Lurie went back a few years later and tried to do a similar experiment, now trying to identify viruses that could infect those resistant mutants. And so these are the results. This is what I consider the first instance of a phage bacteria infection network. If you think about sort of food webs or plant pollinator networks, this is a bipartite network. Right? We have viruses and we have hosts. The viruses are squares, the hosts are in ovals. The solid lines denote the ability of a particular virus to infect a particular host, and the dashed lines denote the evolution of a particular kind into a new kind with different uh, phenotypes, right? Whether host range or susceptibility. And the point to take away that Luria took away is that you had this ancestral phage type alpha, evolved type alpha prime, and if you notice, there are more solid arrows coming out of alpha prime than are of alpha. And the arrows of alpha prime go to all the places that alpha went. So in other words, it can infect the things that the ancestral type can, but new things. The host range could expand and could evolve. And that was also true of this gamma, gamma prime uh, transition. But if you notice, way out there on the end, Lurie observed, a phage-resistant host strain emerged, meaning that it was possible in the conditions of the lab to evolve a host type for which they were unable to find a host range phage mutant that could infect that host. And this leads to a tentative conclusion, but one that really became dogma for about four decades, that the coevolutionary potential of bacteria exceed that of phage. And therefore, in consequence, we should not, I mean, they may be interesting, and in fact, this was the basis for fundamental discoveries in molecular biology, genetics, etc., but ecologically, maybe not so interesting, because you get this. Okay. So I want to, in the course of, of this seminar, to tell you about other ways in which viruses and bacteria interact, and how the interaction at cellular scales affects ecology evolution uh, together. Okay, so I will try to do that in three stages. First of all, asking the question, how does viral infection change host population dynamics, microbial population dynamics, how does evolutionary change then alter this relationship in this virus-host population dynamics? And then going somewhat in the direction of natural environments by 
asked them the question, what is the relationship between infection networks and coexistence and, and natural dynamics? Okay, so in three parts, which also involves a little bit of history. And again, my background is in physics, uh, though I've moved many years ago into more of, let's say, quantitative biosciences. So the culture within physics is to ask questions very early, right? You, you know, just you can't help yourself. And in biology, to wait. So if you, I know this is you know, a semi-large crowd, but if you have a question, feel free to interrupt uh, or wait as you want. So the first part, how does viral infection change microbial population dynamics? And to answer that question, or at least to have the right basis, it's worth also, yet again, going backwards in time to something that I'm sure this crowd uh, certainly will be familiar with, which is the study of predator-prey dynamics vis-a-vis uh, -vis Latka and Volterra. Okay, so many years ago, Vito Volterra and Alfred Latka independently proposed a system implicitly of ordinary differential equations to explain endogenous cycles of predators and prey. And as many of you know, these cycles have a particular character. That is, you have prey peaks, which are followed by predator peaks, then prey decline due to the decline of prey, then predators decline, and then prey increase, and the cycle repeats again. And on the left is the shorthand, for those of you who want to look at the equations, this is the original model by Latka and Volterra, which has some weird features, meaning it's a conservative system, so there are these um, neutrally stable orbits. It's not quite right, but the point is that the Characteristic, if we then look in the prey-predator phase plane, is one of what are called counterclockwise cycles. So here the arrows denote time, and one can think of this same dynamics, but now making time implicit, and noticing that at low amounts of predators, then prey increase, at maximum prey, then predators increase, prey keep decreasing, when prey are at their minimum, then predators decrease. And that's the same way of looking at the information. Right, so we get these characteristic counterclockwise cycles in which the prey peak precedes that of the predator. There are some limits, as I said, to the original model. These have been updated in many ways, one of which is to say you can think about handling time. So if one adds handling time into these very basic models, one gets limit cycles. So true oscillatory dynamics in which this is the classic links hair time series, which first hair peaks, then links, hair, links, hair, links, etc. So you get these long-term oscillations, all of which the predator peak follows that of the prey. Okay, so this is both for theoretical reasons and empirically has been observed. Of course, there have been updates and some other neat features, which I'll try to get to in a moment. So the oscillations, as I say, appear counterclockwise in the prey-predator -pre phase plane. The reason why I'm telling you about Laca and Volterra is that in the 60s and really in the late 1970s, the study of virus-microbe interactions in an ecological sense basically was renewed. And it was renewed by a number of people, largely beginning with some work jointly between Lynn Chow, Frank Stewart, and Bruce Levin at Emory University. And they derived some of their principles really from Laca Volterra, but also from Alan Campbell, in which they proposed interaction between viruses, microbial host, bacteria, and some resource. And they did chemostat experiments in which you flowed in resources at a certain rate, omega. So I'll talk about the model here. These resources, this is the bacteria, these are the viruses. Resources are being flowed in at a rate omega, so you see minus omega everywhere. Everything flows out, but you supply resources. Resources are taken up by bacteria. Bacteria are infected and then releasing new viruses. And if you look at what happens in principle, one would expect that here is a chemostat with only resources and hosts. When you add viruses, viruses increase. You see oscillations. Resources go up, hosts go down. Right? You get a shift from a bottom-up, presumably, to a top-down controlled system, and there are oscillations. Just as one can look at these oscillations of predator-prey dynamics in the phase plane, you can do the same with these bacteriophage dynamics. And again, you see counterclockwise dynamics in principle. I'll show the data in a moment, but I'm going to try to do the same idea of using a theoretical principle and then showing the data afterwards. So here we have these counterclockwise dynamics. One might argue that this is somewhat naive in the sense that this model of viruses infecting bacteria, these are not quite predators, right? They are parasites, obligate intracellular parasites. 
and to get everyone on the same page there, you have a passively diffusing phage which comes in contact with the bacterial host, injecting its genetic material into the host, then replicating, so therefore we have more copies of the genetic material of the virus which then get packaged into these self-assembled particles and through a timed process make a hole in the inner membrane often leading to the release of these lytic enzymes which then make a hole in the cell wall and out go the viruses. From here to there takes some time. Just like there's handling time for a predator to consume a prey, there's also a latent period between infection and release of viable virus particles. So one could go back to these chemostat-like dynamics and say, what happens if we have some delay? Then the question is, how are you going to model the delay? So there are different ways to do it. Here's one with an infected class, which gets closer to, let's call it, epidemiological models, except where the infectious agent is not due to contact between infectious individuals, but through an environmental reservoir of the pathogen. So here we have the change, and now I've gotten rid of the resource layer, made it implicit. We have bacteria, infected bacteria, viruses. In the absence, there will be some logistic growth. There's infection, which leads to now an de increase in the density of infected bacteria. At some rate, eta, these viruses get out. Therefore, 1 over eta we'd interpret to be the average latent period. Releasing beta nu virus particles. Right? And this denotes the fact that free viruses go inside hosts upon infection. And when one simulates these models or solves them, one finds limit cycles counterclockwise orbits. Right? So you again see that the host virus have first, um, we have, let's start here, maximum host, viruses increase, leading to decrease in host. At host minimum, then viruses decline. At the virus minimum, then hosts increase. So the same structure. But one could argue even that is a little bit too simple in the sense that there is not immediately after infection viable virus particles. There should be some finite delay. So one could add in the same structure, make this into a delay differential equation, and basically think about this delay tau at exactly the time tau after infection. There's the release of virus particles. And there's some quantitative difference. But again, you get these counterclockwise cycles. So for a variety of theoretical reasons, one expects that virus microbial population dynamics should have the same signature as predator-prey dynamics. So, Brendan Bohannon, Rich Lensky, you may know both of them for their current work. Brendan, uh, in terms of his work on microbiomes, and Rich Lensky, obviously, for his long-term evolution experiment, they also worked on these simple model systems of E. coli and associated phage in chemostats. This is about a 10-day experiment counting total population density, log axis on the the y-axis logarithmic scale, just to point out here, these are two orders or maybe a little bit less, obviously almost comparable, but there can be two or more orders of magnitude difference in the total population of viruses versus that of their target microbial host and their oscillations. First host peak, then virus. First host, then virus. First host, and then virus. Of course, there's some issues in terms of the coincidence and the sampling rate because these are not being sampled every 15 minutes or every hour and turnover rate is fast. But to the extent that there was a consensus that this was consistent, the notion was this was an example of lock of Volterra like dynamics in a microbial system over a 10-day experiment. Okay? So I'm going to stop there in terms of background and use that as my segue uh, to the question of evolution. So the idea here is that, at least intellectually, from a theoretical perspective, one expects lock of Volterra like dynamics when considering the effect of virus infections on microbial hosts, and the signature of which are these counterclockwise cycles when thinking about the phase plane. But there's a problem here which we should be worried about, is that it's not really possible to stop evolution in these systems, right? So we have simple models presupposing one virus and one microbe in the system, but also presumably over time we may have other kinds or types with different phenotypic characteristics, and that we've known since the 40s from Luria and Delbert. So in this next section, I'm going to then ask the question, how does evolutionary change alter population dynamics? We often ask the question, how does ecology impact evolution? I'd like to do a little bit of, of the reverse and maybe link them together. And this is 
uh, in part, not all of which, but partly joint work with Mike Cortez, who I believe has been here recently. So some of the, this next middle part, but you'll hear a different perspective on it, uh, will be some of his work, and I'll, give a, I'll emphasize a little bit more of the, the phage bacteria relevance and pertinence, and, and I'll move on to the, the last section. He's now at Utah State, but you know who he is. He was here visiting. So let me begin where I left off. And then you also have two different perspectives on one topic, which is often interesting. Right? You see, anyway, Mike was a really strong post on a group. was very lucky and happy to have him uh, work with me. So same data set, 10 days of the experiment. Now let me show you the rest of the experiment. Okay, so this is virus host microbial uh, population dynamics now over about 600 hours. And so now to the students and maybe those who, I don't know if Mike, did Mike talk about this? I should have asked Mike. Um, what did they do at time 200 hours? This is same setup, E. coli B, phage T4, and if you notice, there's obviously a big difference between the dynamics before 200 hours and after 200 hours. I'll direct this to the students. Anyone have an idea? What did they do at time 200 hours? They said what? Switch their host, meaning they, my, the experimentalists put in a new host in the system? Okay. Resistance switch host, and maybe that's what you meant by switch host. So was there any manipulation of the system? Did they, did they change any of the conditions? So we're on the right track, and I'll explain in a moment. There was no change in the setup. There was no change in the input rate. There was no perturbation. So this is an autonomous experiment that's continuing to go on. These are these continuous culture chemostats, which allows you to maintain populations over long periods. And yet, say what? Ah, so I'll, I'll, I'll build to that. So let me go back to this notion of the resistance and the replicability of it. So here you have some change. Let's just talk about what the change is. To the extent that these, we've looked in a moment, Locke Volterra-like dynamics, this is not Locke Volterra like dynamics. This is what's called cryptic dynamics. Because you have, if I were to show you those two time series from a natural system, and I say, well, one's the virus, and here we have these potential hosts, you would not say that that virus infected that host. Right? The virus is oscillating in total population density. The host is basically staying flat. So what is going on that we can have such Large oscillations, the oscillations also extend in time. There's some other neat features there. Oscillations in the virus, it's not being washed out. It's clearly infecting something or it would have gone away in the schema stack because you're always resupplying with new nutrients. So it is infecting something. But why don't we see any corresponding change in the host? So they thought, like these two here in the middle rows, there was the emergence of resistance. And then in fact, they did then identify a resistance strain that had evolved. Then the question is, if there's a resistance strain there, why didn't the virus disappear? Right? So first thing they did was, instead of waiting for the chance event in which this resistant mutant might evolve and then appear or grow to high numbers, they put the resistant strain back in after having marked it so they could distinguish with time the densities of the resistant and the susceptible host. Virus again are in red. Here they've added the resistant host in, and if you notice, the resistant hosts quickly increase in density and fluctuate about a constant number. The susceptible hosts and viruses continue to undergo oscillations. Right? And they look very much like Locke Volterra-like oscillations, where the susceptible host peak precedes that of the virus peak. But yet, if you were to add the susceptible and resistant host density together, it would be embedded in the noise. So really what's happened is we're looking at, there really are two types, but we can only count the sum. And when we can only count the sum, then what we see are virus oscillations, apparently no oscillations in the host, but really the mechanism is that the virus is infecting the susceptible host and the resistant host remains, and it doesn't eliminate the susceptible host because there was a growth cost of resistance. Otherwise, if there had been no cost, it would have also eliminated that susceptible type. Okay. So to sum up what I've told you in two pictures, first of which is, is that a question there? So let me just finish this one thing and then I'll, I'll get that question. 
In the absence of evolution, this virus-microbe interaction involving different degrees of details of the infection process, we predict should lead to a canonical signature of Locke Volterra-like dynamics. In the presence of either host evolution or viral evolution, then it opens the possibility of having cryptic cycles or similar such things as antiphase cycles. And if you've studied anything having to do with predator-prey dynamics, this is a seemingly a more important process than has been given credit. And Elmer's group and others have, have done a very nice recent review of going back retrospectively at predator-prey cycles and finding lots of examples of apparent evolutionary effects on population dynamics where otherwise it had been noted just as weird. And what I'm going to do in the last part, probably to re revisit or remind you of some of the things that Mike Cortez talked about, but I will emphasize in particular some of the virus uh, bacteria uh, implications, which is when you have co-evolution, it's possible to have reversals of these signatures so that you actually have clockwise cycles in the phase plane. And there was a question before I move on to this. So... Right, so remember that even if another mutation event occurred to generate another resistant mutant, right, and which could keep happening, if the phenotypes were not different, we would not otherwise, right, it would just be added more to the, there would be one more resistant host in the community. So it doesn't to say that the cestable host doesn't keep mutating, but if there is a growth a fitness cost of resistance, then the susceptible population that does remain, that has not mutated, will continue to persist in the environment. Okay. So, I'm going to then envision, again, starting with the theoretical basis here, envision now a two-host, two-virus environment in which the viruses differ in their ability to infect the two hosts. This type is able to infect both at higher levels than is this type, and one type of host is more susceptible to infection than is the other type. And if I just now simulate this model with two viruses and two hosts, and I set the appropriate types of costs for such changes in host range and susceptibility, and plot the total virus against the total host population with time, you'll notice that the virus peaks coincide with the increase of the host population. In other words, the hosts seem to do best when the viruses are most abundant. Right? So this is what we'd interpret as these reversal or clockwise cycles. And here these dashed lines denote strain densities, meaning that at the same time scale as there are changes in the total population dynamics, there are also changes in the relative frequency and in fact even the densities of these genotypes. Right? So we have co dynamics taking place at the same time scale as ecological dynamics. And let me now try to, I've just posited this is possible, let me try to provide some explanation and then some data and support. So I can take this same simulation and put it into the phase plane, prey, predator, bacteria, virus, and then the arrows denote time implicitly. So you see that we're now going this way. Lockable terror runs this way. These are running clockwise orbits. And I've put four points there to denote the fact that at those four points I'm going to tell you about the relative frequency of the two host genotypes and the two viral genotypes. So I'll do it as follows, which is red denotes the relative frequencies of the two viral genotypes and blue, that of the host. The solid bar denotes the frequency of the low offense types and the solid bar for the bacteria denotes the frequency of the low vulnerability types. So if we start in the upper left, this is an environment dominated by highly vulnerable hosts and relatively low offense viruses. But given an environment in which there are high vulnerable hosts, if the low offense viruses can still infect and release significant progeny, they could increase in number and this highly vulnerable host may then uh, actually still do very well because it can increase in number by essentially not paying all the costs of having this low vulnerability. So we have low offense, high vulnerability, but yet the prey increase in number. They're not paying the cost and they don't have the high offense viruses near them. But yet, as they shift to this, then over time to this low vulnerability type, 
during the time when we have low offense, they can really increase to their maximum abundance. So essentially, we have a shift to low vulnerability. You see it happening, even as the system is dominated by low offense types. So now, essentially, they're not being infected anymore. They increase to high abundance. But here, given low vulnerability hosts, there's going to be a selective benefit for high offense predators to emerge. In other words, the viruses which have these high offensive traits. And therefore, they start to increase in abundance by essentially invading a system which is dominated by low vulnerability, which then has to switch because there's essentially uh, no point in paying that cost. So they switch back to becoming highly vulnerable. In a situation in which we have high offense types, there's no point for the viruses to pay the cost, so you have a switch back to the low offense types. So we have a orbit here in which the change of the densities is concomitant with the change in these different types. So the clockwise population dynamics are driven by the change in genotype frequency. And are there such cycles in phage bacteria data sets? So I'll again turn to chemostat work, again by Bruce Levin. This is in Vibrio cholera and associated phage, which have an interesting interaction, partly because the toxins of cholera have been mobilized by viruses. But this is an example of a phage which can infect and kill the target Vibrio cholera. And so in these long-term chemostat experiments in a project led by Yan Wei, they observed the following, noted as, again, strange or unusual dynamics. And they're a little bit hard to see in this way. The points I want to make up there are just oscillations. And there's two orders of magnitude variation, meaning many more viruses than there are bacteria in the chemostats. And I'm going to focus on these sections and then move these sections into the phase plane and claim first by waving my hands, but then giving you more evidence, that these are robust examples of clockwise cycles. So these are the four segments I've just shown in order, bacteria, virus, bacteria, virus, in which we have clockwise cycles, admittedly over very short sections of the time series. Okay? And just to point out that they later on went and looked and found that, in fact, these systems were not merely uh, isogenic, uh, isogenotypic in that there was a phage T and a phage B. T stands for turbid plaques, B stands for big plaques. That tells you that there's differences, essentially, in their offensive traits, and also multiple resistance types, ones which could be infected by uh, not the turbid type, and maybe to some extent not even both, with some decrease in infectivity. So we have many of the ingredients here of coevolutionary dynamics with this signature of a clockwise cycle. But again, the thing that troubled us and particularly troubled me was the danger that we had when we were trying to infer a signature from a short time series. So what we did was to take this original time series and take the point-to-point -point variation and regenerate ensembles of such time series that had the same point-to-point -point variation, but we reshuffled the order of when we put those points. So we have the same statistical sense of point-to-point -point variation, but now we've reordered them. And we asked the question, when we do that, do we see a winding in a circle, meaning you start somewhere, get back close to where you are, and you go this way, meaning you wind 2 pi rather than you go the other way. So for each one of these members of the ensemble, we calculate a winding angle and the distance of return between the first and the last point. And that's what I'm showing you here, these summary statistics of this ensemble in which we have winding angle, distance. Each point represents the result of one of these ensembles. The red is what we observe. And the diagonal, uh, the diagonal green is the ideal 2 pi 0, meaning you go right back to where you began in a clockwise fashion. And so statistically speaking, this was very rare to occur by chance. And by comparison, this is the lynx hair data set subjected to the same ensemble approach, where now one expects to come back to where one begins, but winding the other way, where the green is the ideal and the red denotes what the actual data says. So to the extent that we can make any conclusion, at least statistically, we observe that, yes, the Lynx hair time series, even despite the fact that it's not quite a long time series, it took a long time to collect, but it's not that many data points. We believe this is an example of a robust counterclockwise cycle, and this phage bacteria example is one of a clockwise cycle. So to summarize these first two parts in the following three pictures, 
One expects in the absence of evolution to observe counterclockwise cycles with evolution but not coevolution to observe cryptic or antiphase cycles. And with coevolution, it opens the possibility to a new signature or hallmark that of clockwise cycles. Okay? So with that, I'm going to move to the last stage or part of the talk. Partly, uh, I hope generated by a little bit of a worry that this talk has gone one, one, two, one, two, two. And if you go like that, you know, like this is like a very slow proof. It would take me a long time to get to a natural environment. We have many more than five, five, right? We have many times. So I'm going to try to scale up rapidly. So again, this is what I just said, that rapid change in the frequency of genotypes can have effects. Clockwise cycles may be a hallmark. But I'm going to try to now segue what other dynamics emerge in even more complex communities. And this is work, I'm going to try to link a number of projects together in the last 10 minutes or so by Cesar Flores, Luis Jover, and also Michael Cortez. And Luis is uh, finishing up his PhD with me, and Cesar also was a former PhD student in physics. So I'm going to begin this last segment with updating what the conclusion of Lurie and Delbruck was with a bit of a modern view. So in 1989, Berg and colleagues went out into an environment in order to count how many viruses were there in a natural environment? And the way they did this was through a culture-independent method by essentially staining the sample, so anything that had DNA inside of it would stain positive, and then looking under an electron microscope and counting things, if you see those arrows, that were about 50 nanometers in size. And just counting. How many such DNA-containing small virus-like particles were there? And they found the following. the following quote, we have found up to 2.5 times 10 to the 8th, in other words, 250 million virus particles per milliliter. If you ever worked with cultures, I mean, these are sort of rich cultures for a virus even, in natural waters. And the key point here, 1,000 to 10 million times higher than anywhere else. In time. So what did they do that was so magical? Or what was, did they do? Was this some special environment? And they only looked in this special place? Or were they looking in a different way? The answer is that they were looking in a different way at places that other people had looked at before. But the way that people had counted natural virus abundances in the past had utilized culture-based approaches. You would take a microbe that you would isolate, grow it up, and then use plaque assays to say how many viruses per milliliter could infect this particular target host. And it turns out you have the double problem of isolation there. First of all, most bacteria are not culturable yet. Tom is in the audience, so you have to make sure to say yet. Not to say that they're unculturable, but not yet. And in addition, then the viruses themselves may not be culturable in these particular hosts that we're able to isolate for various reasons. So there's a massive gap here. Right? So it's certainly not the case that you just don't find viruses in natural systems that are extremely abundant. This is, again, 1989, so what has been done recently? So I led a group, largely empiricist, but together with Steve Wilhelm at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, the two of us organized a working group in which we, one of our aims, there were many, was to collect about 20 years, so that since that 1989 paper, about 20, 25 years of work had been done uh, on trying to estimate the density of viruses and bacteria in natural systems. And this represents the cumulative number of samples focusing on ocean samples that we found were available, in which where there was both the position time, all that information, also the total virus and total uh, bacterial counts in the system. Has anyone ever heard of this notion of 10 to 1 viruses? Anyone heard of that before? So there are supposed to be 10 viruses. And I was taught that in 2006. 10 viruses per every, per, um, per let's say, 10 times as many viruses as there are bacteria in natural systems. So we, we had many reasons to do this, but one of the first things we asked was the following. How true is that? So this is the update. Prokaryotes per milliliter, we should really just interpret as bacteria. Viruses per ml. To guide the eye, this is the one-to-one -one line. This is the hundred-to-one line. The contours denote the fact that we're looking at 5,000 data points, so we want to show you probability distributions. But I think you should take away that this does not sit very cleanly on a 10-to-1 curve. So natural variation of viruses and bacteria range from about 1 to 100. There's some neat scaling relationships here, which we are uh, in the process of, of submitting back 
uh, after review. But the point is also that this notion that Berg found, that viruses are very abundant. If you look here per milliliter, they did find a bit of an exceptional case in terms of the overall density. But this notion that viruses are relatively more abundant than microbes, even in natural systems, despite the fact that it was possible in the lab to evolve host range uh, resistant mutants, holds that we have significant virus densities in natural systems. And with many kinds, or many types of viruses, or excuse me, with large abundance of viruses, also comes many kinds of viruses. So here's one estimate. The marine sediment sample contained between 10,000 and 1 million viral genotypes. So the point I want to take away from that particular quote by Forrest Rauer and Rob Edwards is that there are also many kinds of viruses in natural systems. And also that estimating viral diversity is not so well defined at the moment. Right? We have two orders of magnitude variation in this estimate. There are reasons for that. So you can see why it would be dangerous for me beginning where I did in the first two sections to say, well, all we need to do, we have some rules and we add a few types, but how do I know who infects whom? And if I don't know who infects whom, it's hard for me to understand principles of dynamics that may be occurring in these highly diverse environments. So what my group did was went back to try to collect the data that others had collected to analyze and ask, are there any ubiquitous patterns of interactions that may occur within complex communities? And if so, we could then ask questions about the mechanisms of coexistence there, constraining ourselves to more realistic infection networks. So that's what we tried to do. And we did that the way that others do it, which is that others collected bacteria and phage for what are called host phage typing studies, environmental studies, and so forth. You take here some tap agar, which there's bacteria, you add viruses, triplicate, they form plaques that says this particular virus infects this particular host. And when you don't see plaques, you don't see clearing, means it cannot infect. So this is similar to plant pollinator studies or, or essentially food web studies. But here, the zero means you tried and it didn't work. So we're going to take a set of bacteria, a set of viruses, and try all possible combinations and see who infects them. And this is the result when you take what's done here for a few, and you scale it up to many, 14 virus types, 18 phage types. And just the point here is that the white cells denote the ability of the virus in the column to infect the host in the row. Okay. So we took this study and many others to try to perform a bit of a meta-analysis. Did anything pop out? And you can probably see here, this was after taking a long time to collect and manually curate 38 studies over 12,000 different infection assays. Not much jumps out. Now, this is potentially disappointing. But of course, this was the original format of the original publication. So if I have 20 viruses and 20 bacteria, then there are 20 factorial squared ways of looking at this data. You can't explore that entire space, but you can use heuristics to try to see, are there typical patterns of relationships between who infects whom. So we applied these, what are called standard bipartite uh, network methods, and we identified, and I'll focus your eyes here, a characteristic nested pattern. And that means that who infects whom seems to be nested, their host range between nested within the next type. Specialist viruses, generalist viruses, very susceptible host types, very resistant host types. And the signature of nestedness is that the specialist type infects the bacteria that everyone else infects. It doesn't specialize on the difficult. It specializes on the easy. And let me just show you one more example of that. Original data. This is the same data, just where I've shifted the rows and columns that you can now more evidently see the pattern of nestedness. Now, it's not perfect, which I'll also raise in a second. If I just, do you have a quick question? I'm getting near the end. Ah. So for the, for the most part, you, it's building phylogenies for virus, non-trivial, whole separate discussion. But many of these, there was not enough information in terms of sequences because they were collected in the 90s. Some cases there were. So the question I, I can answer is that the scale of diversity phylogenetically of the host tended to be either differences of strains at species gender or in some cases family scale. Right? So these are not widely divergent types, and actually raises an important point, that if you were to look at infection networks across widely divergent types, then you get modularity. Because viruses cannot, for the most part, 
go beyond the largest, I've, widest I've seen is at the family level. They have, I don't see any evidence of virus infecting two strains that differ in what a phylogenist would call the family scale. Okay. Good. So the point I want to make here is that phage bacteria infection networks, and your, your point is well raised, at microevolutionary scales, meaning within closely related bacteria, sure, and people are now trying to understand the basis for it. But the basis for infection is still quite hard. But we'll, let me save that because I'm getting close to the end of the time. Are typically nested. And so what we then wanted to do was say, okay, if this appears common, how can we have coexistence? And I'll try to explain why we raised that question. This is an example in some sense of niche differences, but not with complete niche separation. Why does this host uh, type outcompete the rest? It's only infected by one virus, so is everyone else. Likewise, why isn't the specialist virus outcompeted by everyone else? It infects one host that everyone else infects. So this led to the following, similar to what, my, what we did in the first part of this talk, ask the question, if we imagine this is the infection network, and we ask the question of how they coexist, would it happen? So considering the same structure, these lock of Volterra dynamics, the only thing I want you to take away here are two letters, this I and J, meaning we have different host types, different viral types, and this MIJ, meaning we have a, an infection network, which is not one-to-one, -one, but rather is nested. So we're going to take a lock of Volterra dynamic, but now have nested networks and say, can this coexist, and if so, how and why? And if you take such a system, and now you just still take this two-by-two two system, you find that sometimes with a nested network, all the types coexist, hosts and viruses, and sometimes some of them go, they disappear out of these uh, in silico dynamics. There are two viruses, two hosts. They have the same nested network. There's no issue here of initial conditions. The difference here that we've played with between these two model outcomes is they differ in their life history traits. So this nestness which we see doesn't in and of itself promote biodiversity insofar as there are not the necessary trade-offs for coexistence to be possible. So the details are in this paper by Jover et al. and JTB. The notion, and I think it's intuitive, if there is a trade-off between the growth rate and the host range so that the most susceptible host grows the fastest and that which is least susceptible grows the slowest. And likewise, if the specialist virus ex is the most efficient at exploitation, where efficiency is better if you go lower, and the generalist virus is the least efficient at exploitation, so if you have two kinds of trade-offs, then you can get arbitrary coexistence in these types. So nestedness can be consistent with high levels of coexistence so long as trade-offs are present. So that raises the question, are there evidence for trade-offs? One of the first things I said was a discovery by Lurie and Delbruck that there, were, you know, there could be potential fitness, cost of resistance, and likewise seen by uh, Levin in that 1977 paper. So here's an example of an effort to measure growth rate versus resistance, the cost of resistance, strains, relative growth rate. All of these bars denote significant growth rate cost of resistance, but you notice it's not inevitable. Likewise here, these are fitness on original hosts in an RNA-5-6 study. All of these mutants confer expanded host range. So these are viruses that can infect more hosts. And you see their fitness on the original host often goes down. But in some cases, there is no cost of having expanded host range. So this begins to also raise the question, is the benefit in terms of biodiversity of nestedness robust to slight variations in nestedness, which we saw in the data, and also slight variations in the degree to which there are trade-offs. And so that's the last thing I'll tell you about, and I'm about two minutes away from finishing. What we did is, in silico, again, try a continuum of models from nested to modular nest. As a function of nestedness, when we run these models, do we see more and more biodiversity? And the answer we get when we impose the trade-offs, we have at maximum nestedness, all the types coexist. But even when we have partially nested networks, that tends to increase biodiversity, as long as there are trade-offs. And likewise, here from upper left to lower right, you see that there's the same statistical relationship, but it declines in its strength as we make the trade-offs 
only statistically true, meaning they're not hold strictly, but they tend to hold. So the conclusion we take away is that nestedness can promote biodiversity, as people have found in other studies, but we, we claim is that it depends on traits. It's not just about the network. There are regimes in trait space that are consistent such that more nested needs more biodiversity, but it's not inevitable to the extent that the trade-offs tend to hold that can also lead to promotion of biodiversity. And the first part has been published here, and the other part about the statistical tendency is in review at scientific reports. So with that, I'm going to acknowledge, make one plug, and finish up. The people who did this work, Charles Wigington, Luis Jover, Cesar Flores, Michael Cortez, collaborators, uh, as well as this working group on ocean viral dynamics. And I want to close with two plugs. The first of which is I spent a year in sabbatical in Arizona, where most of has done some time as well, with Matt Sullivan, who's now at Ohio State. And in the process, wrote a monograph called Quantitative Viral Ecology. It's in the uh, Monographs and Population Biology series, the Green series, as, as many of you know. It'll be available this December. It is meant to provide an introduction for people far from viral ecology, meaning far from e even ecology evolutionary biology, to introduce these concepts to physicists, mathematicians, but I'd like to think also to ecologists and evolutionary biologists for whom virus-microbe interactions may be new. Uh, and I bring somewhat of a physical approach to the problem, meaning the physical basis of life history traits in addition to understanding the dynamics. And the other thing I want to plug is that I am the director of a new PhD program at Georgia Tech. And for those of you in the audience who know an undergraduate who's thinking of leaving the Midwest and the North to go to the South or just would like to explore a, a new campus and new opportunities, we are accepting applications and welcoming people both from the physical and mathematical sciences, but also from the biosciences who would like to include core training and modeling, simulation dynamics as part of their work in the bioscience space. And qbios.gatech.edu, I have flyers. I'm more than happy to leave them here and not take them with me. So feel free to ask if you're interested. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. a little bit over time. Are there any questions left? You see one here in the middle. Yep. Right, so in, in a model in which I think the, the question is, is your ho if we're a virus, you could ask the question, how rare must the host be for you to make it? And so this is also relevant to the question of a newly evolved virus type. So you're the newly evolved virus type, you're singular. It's maybe just one of you, right? Or a few of you, but one in the local environment. And so whether or not that particular virus type increases or not, one can think about is, do you find and infect a susceptible host before either in these chemostatic experiments you're washed out or before through some spontaneous process you decay? Right? So it is a probabilistic question, and one can really define this. The answer is a chance or a probability. But if the host density is high enough, right, that increases the chance that you're able to infect. So a rare virus can rise very quickly from rare. So being singular is not so bad as long as your target hosts are common. If your target hosts are rare because they're being affected by so many things, and that's the only thing you can infect, then it becomes harder for the mutant type that infects it to increase in abundance. Because its survival is density dependent. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Yes, sir? First Aaron, then Aaron. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Aaron, you first. Right, so, okay, great question. So we, we have been asking that exact question. So in the series of models I just talked about, we presume it's there to different degrees and ask what are the consequences. And that is partly inspired by plant pollinator work that's asking is this, if, if it's there, it's sort of, is it a Garden of Eden configuration, or if it's there, would it tend to not lead to more collapses? But we have started to build models in which you have different structures and ask if I have a type 
whose change in the network increases or decreases nestedness, would that tend to lead to it to stick around or not? Right? And so we have started to go in that direction with some simple models, but to do that right, you have to also build in trade-offs. So others have looked, um, a group, Hal Smith and also Kim Sneppen, and have found that if you impose the same trade-offs we've imposed and allow mutants to come in, you can bootstrap your way up and actually have increasing nestedness in these models. The first thing I ever did in this whole space of viral ecology was looking at co-evolution, where you start from a low-dimensional system and emerge with high-dimensional systems for the simple reason that if I think from a um, competition, competitive exclusion idea, I have one host, if I start with one uh, virus, I could have two bacteria. One that's better at resource consumption, one um, that is better at avoiding viruses. But if both can evolve, when I have two bacterial types, I can now have two virus types that can start to specialize. But now when I have two virus types, I could have three bacteria. So you can actually, these models do lead to an increase in diversity autonomously via the co-evolutionary process. Whether or not they always end up in nestedness or modularity or other features depends on the trade-offs. But they certainly can, um, in an autonomous way, have start from a low diversity system and end up in a high diversity system. Yes. Did you have a question? Oh, okay, not the not those equis. Okay, fine. But <laughs> the second slide. Right, I don't get stuck on that one. Yeah. Right. So the reason I stopped it right there is that that's not a dynamic in the sense that the first that first study of Lurie and Delbruck says, when I have a, an exposure to a large, so many viruses that everything ha is exposed to a virus, then the benefits, if there's, as long as I survive, then you can imagine I could transfer that to the next agar plate, and all I would have left are these resistant mutants, irrespective of their growth rate costs. Now imagine I hadn't put as many viruses, only some of the bacteria were exposed. Then if they're resistant, you, you, you replicate, but now I put them onto the next plate and let them compete. Even though they, they preferentially survive, they start to lose in that next round during just the growth phase. Then I had the virus. But that's a sort of kind of stage way of doing what happens naturally continuously. So the point is all these other models say, okay, fine, resistance is part of the story. But if we want to understand population dynamics, we also need to understand traits, and those traits may be pleiotropic in a sense, involving both uh, defense as well as these growth costs. So, you know, Luria, it's not the final word, but it's a good entree to understanding what else you need to do, I think, yeah. if that helps. Wasn't quite what you asked. Okay. Well, I answered some questions. Is a high growth rate assumed in, uh, in all of these uh, um, uh, model systems, or uh, have you uh, run these models Right, so that's a, that's a good point in the sense that some of the models that we're running here, one can tune the resource input. For example, those first chemostat studies, and they're robust, independent of how well you mean. You always get these, let's say, counterclockwise cycles. But the, uh, the rate at which the system runs may change. Some of the signatures may remain. But I think the point which I didn't even get to today, which I think is most importantly raised in potentially in oligotrophic regimes, it may be the question of the effect of the nutrient status of the host on the viral traits, including even qualitative exploitation strategies, lysogeny or lysis. Or pseudolysogeny. Or pseudolysogeny. Sure, hanging. That's right. Though it, it's funny, in my